OK. OK. Deputy Paul McLaughlin is substituting for Deputy Matt Carty. Deputy Christopher O'Sullivan is substituting for Senator Paul Daly. And Deputy Thomas Pringle is substituting for Deputy Michael Fitzmaurice. No, no, apologies, no apologies have been received. Before we begin, can I remind members that in the context of the current COVID-19 restrictions, only the chairman and staff are present in the committee room, and all other members must join me remote, remotely from elsewhere in the parliamentary precincts. The Secretary can issue invitations to join the meeting on MS Teams. Members may not participate in the meeting from outside the parliamentary precincts. Please mute your, your microphones when you are making a contribution, and please use the raise hand function to indicate. Please note that messages sent in the meeting chat are visible to all participants. Speaking slots will be prioritised for members of the committee. Today's meeting is in two sessions. One, 3.30 to 4.30, engagement with representatives of the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority, and 4.30 to 5.30, engagement with representatives of the Killy Beggs Fishermen's Organisation, the Irish Fish Producers Association, the Fish Processors and Exporters Association, the Irish South, West, South and West Fish Producers Organisation, and the Irish South and East Fish Producers Organisation. Session one. Um, pre and uh, pre legislative scrutiny of the Sea Fisheries Amendment Bill 21, the 2020 pre WC review of the organisation capacity of the SFPA and the decision to revoke the Irish Control Plan for the weighing of fishery products after transport. I would like to welcome this meeting the following representatives of the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority Dr. Susan Steele, Chairperson, Ms. Olive Lucknan, Director of Transformation, and Mr. Andrew Keenan, um, author Authority Member. They are all joining remotely. You are very welcome to this meeting. We have received your opening statement and briefing material which has already been circulated to members. We are limited in our time due to COVID-19 safety restrictions, and so the committee has agreed that the opening statement will be taken as read, so we can use a full session for questions and answers. All opening statements are published on the Oxford's website and publicly available. Before we begin, an important note is in relation to parliamentary privilege. Privilege. Witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of the evidence you are to give to the committee. However, you are directed by the Committee to see if giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so. You are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Participants in the committee meeting from a location outside the parliamentary precincts are asked to note that the constitutional protections afforded to those participating from between the parliamentary precincts does not extend to them. No clear guidance can be given on whether the extent to which the participation is covered by absolute privilege of a statutory nature. I now invite questions from the members um, to our witnesses and Deputy Collins. Um, he was first on screen and he's the first to indicate. So, Deputy Collins. Thank you. Uh very much, Chairperson. I appreciate uh, you allowing me in, uh, to speak here, and uh, I'd like to welcome our witnesses. Um, I suppose straight in, I, I have a good number of questions, and I, I just hope I can get answers to all or most of them. Any, and if not, I might get them, get it in writing afterwards. And I don't want to um, do much entry discussion, especially in relation to the weighing uh, crisis that's out there, the weighing of fish crisis. It's a massive, massive issue. It's um, I presume every coastal TD is 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 is, is uh, inundated with uh, with calls from a very concerned fishermen that you know a lot of them are very close to the brink and and are very seriously worried about their their future. And I, and I have been asked to issue a welcome to the Raptors Committee, and obviously maybe in pandemics that might, time might be difficult for us to be able to visit uh, processing plants with, with the EU, the SAP, the department, etc., and let everyone have their say. And uh, they would suggest uh, the exact same thing with whitefish and shellfish and lobster, shrimp and crab, uh, for they to visit uh, co-ops in West Cork, like Baltimore, Union Hall, Skull, Turkhead, Colour, Pier, or others. But the questions I have for the SAP is, 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 is these, and you might be able to take them down and maybe answer them as many as you can here. Do you accept that the mismanagement of this entire debacle is adding to the anti-European sentiment in our country? Because on the face value, it's an act of madness to throw the fisheries industry into turmoil inside one hour on the 16th of April, when they were told basically at 4 p.m. that every, that evening everything was normal, but at 5 p.m. nothing was normal and a new regime was in place. Do you think this is acceptable behaviour for a regulatory uh, body? 
And uh, the second question is, have you seriously looked at how this new regime of weighing on peers is going to impact our main, two main ports, Killy Biggs and Castletown Bear, as well as the small ports in, in West Cock, especially during pelagic season for landings when a daily landing of five to 6,000 tonnes of fish is common during the pelagic season. It takes numerous factories weighing on their own plant in factory devices eight to nine hours a day to clear their fish. How is the SFPA going to manage putting all landings to all plants through peer weighing where no facilities exist for that scale uh, of, of throughput. And the third question, do you accept that this uh, could lead to a serious amount of landings going elsewhere, to Norway, Shetland or Scotland? I'm not just uh, talking about the Irish vessels, but other EU vessels refusing to come to our ports due to uncertainty at present. This in turn will be at a very serious economic loss to the Irish economy. Do you think this is acceptable? And another question, are you committed to restoring in factory weighing? Can you assure us today that it is a real possibility, it's part of the programme for government, the government and that the government are committed to it? And uh, the fifth question, do you see weighing in factories as a policy matter or solely an operational matter at this juncture? And uh, the sixth question is control and quality monitoring needs to be separated from the SFP. The events since the 16th of April has proven to, to them that the SFP cannot do both with equal fairness. Quality is a second is a second when it comes to uh, control in the eyes of the SFP. Despite your article stating both must be done equal priority, it's crazy what your officers are asking uh, fishers to do on the peer side at present. And it's going to get worse after the 1st of June unless uh, someone calls this out. And um, what information did the SFP give uh, to, about, uh, to the EU about the system? And I'd like to know why did they accept the EU audit findings? And also, who did the SFPA speak with prior to responding uh, to the audit report? Uh, POs, fishermen, SFPA senior port officers, SFPA officers on the ground. And I suppose one of the final questions, uh, what measures have you put in place to limit the damage and alleviate the hardship? That is, uh, draconian measures of withdrawal of weighing in factories uh, will have on our fishing industry. Is it true that for years, Prior to this happening, the fishing industry has been uh, imploring both um, the SFP and the department to implement a code of practice governing how SFP fisheries protection officers should interact with the industry and discharge their statutory responsibilities, and not just in the area of enforcement, but just as significantly in the area of certification of Irish fish uh, fisheries produce in the context of health and hygiene uh, and the provisions of safe and healthy fisheries product that is fit for human consumption. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Deputy Collins. Um, comprehensive questions there for the witnesses. So I hand over to the witnesses, Dr. Steele and your colleagues. Whoever wants to take that first, please. That's great. Um, thank you very much, um, Deputy Collins. And um, as, a, as a fellow West Cork person, um, it's uh, it's good to be talking to you. And the invitation of visiting processing plants uh, with members of the Oroctus um, or with others. Um, we were, we've always um, taken any meetings with the industry or with yourselves. Um, so just to say thank you very much for extending that. Um, you've asked a significant number of questions. So if it's OK, um, Chair, what I'd like to do is just to go back into what's happened with the revocation of the control plan, because I'm aware some deputies are very well versed on what's happened. And for others, you're going to be looking at this and there's a large number of questions. So the, we'll talk about weighing of fish. So weighing of fish is a very important part of a fisheries management system. Under EU law, the accuracy of the weighing of catches landed is the responsibility of the operator. The law states that all wild caught fishery products must be weighed at landing before transport, and there are a number, number of potential derogations. In 2012, the SFPA submitted and obtained commission approval for derogations, and there were five separate plans that we um, submitted at that point, a control plan, two sampling plans, and common control programs with Bel Belgium and France. We consulted extensively both internally and with the Irish fishing producer organisations. Under the control plan, um, which is what the deputy is speaking about, from 2012 until 2021, weighing was following transport to Irish establishments, was allowed once it took places in a premises, usually a processor permitted by the SFPA for that purpose. 
The weight derived would be used by fishers to make their landing declarations and to reckon uptake from available um, quota. The European Commission decided recently to revoke this derogation for demersal and pelagic fisheries with immediate effect. So what I want to talk about here is how we ended up with this um, decision from the Commission. And it was made as it deemed the risk of industry's non-compliance with the rules of the common fisheries policy too high. This decision arises from an administrative inquiry the Commission requested that Ireland carry out following an audit in Ireland in 2018 aimed at monitoring the implementation of Ireland's control for pelagic fisheries. The administrative inquiry looked at possible under declaration of catches between 2012 and 2016 and investigations of the same, sanctions for operators, effectiveness of the Irish sanctions system and effectiveness of the Irish control system. In particular, the Commission identified that the operator did not have in place a weighing system fit for purpose and the audit identified manipulation of weighing systems. Moreover, although aware of these shortcomings, Ireland did not take appropriate measures to address such non-compliance, in particular by withdrawing the permission to weigh after transport. Consequently, the control plan um, does not, uh, or was, did not, uh, in the view of the Commission, minimise the risk of systematic manipulation of weighing of pelagic catches in Ireland and the under-declaration of catches by operators. Therefore, Ireland could not guarantee an effective control of landed quantities of catches and could not minimise the risk of non-compliance with the rules of the common fisheries policy, which I think all of us here are in agreement um, is uh, a policy which would lead to sustainability in our fisheries and um, in our coastal communities. The revocation centres around post-transport weighing of pelagic landings, specifically, and again, just for deputies, what are what is a pelagic fish? It's mackerel, horse mackerel, herring, blue whiting and sprat. It's landed um, into 11 processing um, plants in Ireland. In contrast to the traditional fish boxes, these fish landings are highly mechanised, involving pumping fish ashore in bulk with significant quantity of transport water and involve practical challenges when it comes to trying to verify the quantity of fish involved. It's easier to hide fish because it's harder to accurately cut, quantify the amount of fish moving rapidly when they're mixed with water. The weighing of fish and water or draining of water from fish has been an issue over many decades in Ireland and actually was what led to the standalone setup of the SFPA. So the questions that you asked is, do we accept the mismanagement of this debacle? Um, or what do we think is, is acceptable behaviour and how we go forward? To answer to the deputy in that, the SFPA employs over 150 people across the major fishing ports around the coast and in our headquarters in Clonakilty. These are colleagues who are committed to fulfilling our extensive remit for sea fisheries protection and seafood safety to the highest level of governance. In the case of our sea fisheries officers, this work can be done in difficult and challenging circumstances. We have acknowledged that there have been learnings and we are committed to addressing them as, um, uh, as our decision uh, to the Commission and our capability review highlights. We continuously reappraise and build on many learnings, all the time working towards improving and focusing controls to manage non-compliance risks. But this doesn't answer the next question of the Deputy about how will the weighing affect the um, larger scale landings all over the country. The SFPA have been meeting and consulting with the industry in relation to this. We've been working on solutions with the industry, both in relation to weighing, um, weighing devices, training and in relation to the questions and quality of fish. The deputy then asks if we accept that this could lead to landings to go elsewhere. Um, that's a matter for, for those who are deciding where to land, uh, not for the control um, authority. In relation to the question of control and quality measuring, the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority, as is in the opening remit, has a very broad and extensive remit. We don't just look after the regulation of the commercial sea fishing industry and fishers' compliance with CFP. We also look after um, 
wild and farmed fish, the classification of wild and farmed mollusk areas. We look after food tra trade controls, catch and health certification of Irish fish exports. We look after the control of compliance with maritime and environmentally protected areas. We look after infrastructure provision to facilitate fishers or vessel operators' compliance um, with their obligations. We function for data provision to the state and the EU on sea fisheries activity. We give advice to government um, as regards policy and fishery control, food safety controls and food trade controls. And we look at fishery control for all Irish registered um, fishing vessels. So yes, um, there is a large remit for the SFPA. The SFPA is committed through all of its staff to delivering excellence in its full remit. The next question that you asked in relation to what information um, went to the EU, the EU carried out an audit in 2018. Following that audit, they um, asked Ireland to carry out an administrative inquiry. Again, for the deputies who might not be aware of how this works, the Commission requested uh, significant amounts of information from the SFPA in relation um, to historic fisheries data to cases um, in large numbers um, of areas in relation to the pelagic fisheries which were provided. This information went to the EU. And in the last question, um, and apologies, um, Deputy Collins, because there is a number of questions, in relation to um, is the SFPA going to commit to weighing in factories? The SFPA moved over the last season to having um, weighing on the pier. Um, we will be moving for pelagic fisheries um, to having um, control weighings on the pier. Um, and we're far from being in a situation where there would be weighing approved in the factories um, because the reason that we're in this situation is due to um, the issues that have been identified in the pelagic factories. In relation to whitefish and shellfish, the SFPA would um, like to state that we don't see the same risk um, and we will be working and consulting with industry in relation to a control um, plan. If I, again, it, just due to the number of questions, um, if it's okay, I'd just like to bring in Andrew Keneen just to see if he's anything to add or if I missed anything and apologies, Deputy, if I did. Andrew. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Deputy Collins. As uh, Dr. Steele says, there was a wide range of questions there, and I think we will follow up on, on today's uh, meeting with you with uh, a one-to-one -one just to make sure we both understood your questions and uh, you're getting from us. Uh, but just to, to revisit some of the, the uh, areas covered by uh, Dr. Steele, um, you were asking whether we agreed with the administrative inquiry. The, as, uh, as we pointed out, the administrative inquiry uh, was uh, supported by Ireland, as we are legally obliged to do, uh, by the provision of data to the Commission. This data was primar primarily concerned uh, with uh, uh, the uh, landing of, of pelagic fish uh, into Killy Beggs over the time period of 2012 uh, to 2016. Uh, we provided the, the Commission with very detailed records on the, the uh, data we had on hand with regard to what was recorded by the masters and vessels, what we had recorded on file with regard to the, the dipping of vessels and so on. And we made every effort to respond to the Commission with a complete data set. Okay. Um, we also have uh, in our, our contacts with the Commission, uh, being very clear about our views as technical experts and as the competent authority about what we regard as the technical limitations to, to uh, data gathered from the dipping of refrigerated saltwater tanks. Uh, we have to consultations we've had with the Marine Survey Office and other experts have reason to uh, communicate to the Commission our reservations about how reliable the data gathered there would be, in so much that at any one time uh, the readings taken could be affected by uh, the trim and attitude of the vessel, which in turn would have been 
a function of what water or fuel was on board or how the fish was being stored okay. thanks, as thanks, it was being thanks. discharged. Okay, well. Mr Green, thanks. I, I have a number of other deputies that want to put questions. So thank you, Chair. We'll move on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Deputy McLaughlin. Uh, Magat, uh, so the first question I have uh, is, does the SFPA believe that a person or persons facing charges that impact on their reputation and their livelihood have a right to be presented with the evidence so that they can defend themselves? That's my first question. Okay. Uh, who wants to take that? Um, sorry, I assume that you're talking about the commission weighing here, because obviously um, that is uh, that question will depend on the on the situation. Do you want to elaborate, please, Deputy? Yeah, any person who would be faced with charges that would damage their reputation or their livelihoods would expect that the evidence that led to those charges be presented to them so that they can defend themselves. Do you agree with that as a right? as a principle of law? Is, are you, sorry, Deputy, this is your, uh, are you referring to the commission decision to remove I'm asking you a question. I'm, I'm asking you a question. If I were making charges against you, for example, or any of your officials that damaged your reputation or livelihood, would you expect that I would present you with the evidence to justify those charges? I'll turn it around in that way. Okay. So if, um, so if we're speaking as a regulator and if a regulator is making a decision, so in a regulatory role, we're making a decision on anybody in the fishing industry when we're presenting a case material to go to the DPP, then we follow the due process that's in there. In the same way we would do that with the points situation. So, um, so with, with uh, submission under the points legislation. So that, um, as a regulator, there's all, the process is very, very well laid out through the courts. The process is very, very well laid out through the points legislation. So um, a person has a right of appeal, a person has a right of defence. Okay, thanks for that. Now, in terms of this uh, EU or European Commission audits uh, that was uh, made available uh, to you and the government in 2018, Apparently, it covers the period 2012 to 2000, sorry, early 2015. So it's the period 2012 to early 2015. This commission audit was presented to yourselves. Uh, you then uh, chose to carry out an administrative inquiry. Now, this audit, uh, and I'm not sure of your administrative inquiry, has clearly been leaked to a range of national media um, there have been three articles uh, in mainstream media that have referred to this article uh, uh, and to this uh, report and this audit in detail. Do you think that's acceptable when the very industry whose reputation and livelihood is under such serious threat has not been afforded the right to actually see those reports and defend themselves in any way, shape or form? So the first thing here is to say that the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority takes its commitments under data protection very seriously. So in any situation where any data has um, been leaked, we have um, taken uh, the data protection extremely seriously. In relation to the audit and the administrative inquiry, just to... to, to the SFPA under um, legislation is bound to carry out the administrative inquiry. It's not that we choose to carry it out. It is that following an audit, um, the Commission will request an administrative inquiry, which is what has happened in this situation. In relation um, to the question on whether or not um, the audits, which I, again, sorry, I just want to check with the deputy, which is, uh, I think what, what you're kind of asking here is, do we support the publication of the EU report and its own administrative report? Is is that um, what you're you're asking? Or I, I suppose to? what I'm asking is: Is it acceptable that uh, three national media outlets have reported on mass illegality, alleged mass illegality in the Irish fishing industry, overfishing to the uh, tune of tens of thousands of tons, 
uh, that will cost tens of millions, you know, couldn't be more damaging to the reputation of the industry. And yet nobody, none of the representatives of that industry have actually seen this report, have had any chance to defend themselves in any way, shape or form. Do you think that's an acceptable way to do business? Okay, I'll just come in and then I can see um, that Andrew Keneen wants to come in. but. So first of all, it is stated on record that the SFPA uh, strongly supports um, the publication of all DG Mare audits of all member states and third countries. When we deal with DG Sante audits of food controls, they are published. We um, put this as submission into the new last control regulation. As regulators um, uh, and uh, in the values of our organisation, we're in the view that this level of transparency serves to help the confidence of those we regulate and that there's a level playing field regarding the application of European legislation. There is, um, I suppose, just to answer here, there, there is no SFPA administrative report. There is um, uh, an EU audit findings. And just to be aware that under Article 4 of Regulation 1049 of 2001 of the European Parliament regarding public access to European Parliament, Council and Commission documents, no documents relating to the administrative inquiry can be made public. So, you know, I can hear what you're saying, Deputy, and I just, if it's okay, I just would like to ask Mr. Um, Andrew Keneen to come in because I, I can see that he'd like to hear. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Steele. Uh, uh, Deputy McLaughlin, look, there's no question, but we agree with the procedures of natural justice in the courts where an individual has the right to know uh, not just what they're being accused of, but the evidence backing that up and who their accuser is. And we would fully value uh, value and follow the, the standards of, of the Irish judicial system and would, wouldn't uh, quibble with any of that. As uh, Dr. Steele says, we are bound by the legal provisions uh, in European law and does, it does not give us discretion uh, to publish uh, the uh, uh, the audit findings or the details of the administrative inquiry. But we, we can assure you, Deputy, that we are uh, neither in the business of, of leaking confidential information uh, to the general public or to the media, nor we, are we in the business to constrain what the media choose, uh, what is fit to publish. So we are not in that space at all. Uh, but we, as Dr. Steele says, we have been on record over time uh, that we are in favour for a, a higher level of transparency with regard to the publication of, of audits and the response from member states to audit findings, as is the case with our dealings in um, uh, food safety with DG Sanko, but is not the case with uh, DG Fish. My final question in this round, uh, Kahirla, is in terms of the weighing systems. Now, I want to put on the record of this committee that in recent times I have observed the weighing systems at a factory in Kelly Beggs, County Donegal. I want to describe the scenario there. So as the fish are coming over the weighing device, this weighing device is state of the art. It is uh, virtually impossible to tamper with. It's sealed. Uh, it's under surround CCTV. The weighing system is monitored round the clock uh, by the SFPA. So the SFPA have their eyes on this weighing system. This is an NSAI, National Standards Authority of Ireland weighing system. They can come and inspect that weighing system unannounced at any time. So that's the front of house oversight of the weighing system. The SFPA have monitors observing those fish and that weighing system. So if you tried to tamper with it, you'd be a bloody fool. Uh, if you look at the issue then of um, uh, 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 of the, 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 the back end of the operation, you can clearly see fish being loaded into packaging, 20 kilograms per box, 60 boxes, 1.2 ton. You can get access to the freezer. Uh, to, to At any time, your officials can go in there and do that. Indeed, the industry are very eager to cooperate with the SFPA to have full oversight at any time, shape or form. Now, if I were you in the SFPA and the reputation of our entire industry of fishers and fish producers was being uh, taken apart uh, due to a leaked report that the very industry uh, under attack cannot even read to defend themselves. I would seek to tell that story that I saw of my own eyes. I don't think there's any industry 
uh, that would be subject to that level of oversight. But they're okay with it because they want to keep fishing. They want to keep making a livelihood for themselves and the people who work in their factories. So I put that to you. What I've just described, do you think that's a level of oversight that you could present to the European Commission? I, um, we're obviously we, we welcome every effort that the fishers and we have always worked with them and supported them in their compliance um, with the control regulation and in particular the requirement um, to weigh fish. However, um, the decision from the Commission that we're looking at now is in relation um, that the weighing of fish would have to be prior to transport. And um, this is due to historical issues um, with the industry-owned machinery. And there is a requirement um, to have state-owned weighing machinery um, to weigh the pelagic um, fish. So, yes, what you're describing um, is, is a system. Um, yes, there are cameras that are on the system, but there are still um, concerns in relation um, to the systems. Um, so that is the reason for the decision for the Commission to remove the control plan. Um, I'm just going to go to um, Andrew, Mr. Andrew Kinnean, um at this point. Uh, thank you, Dr. Steele. Um, Deputy McLaughlin, just just to to respond very directly to to what you're saying there, and uh, what is an apparent high level of transparency on on the part of the industry. Uh, unfortunately, the, the Commission is fighting it very hard to get past. Uh, the record that there has been a, a, a criminal conviction against an, ind an individual processor for uh, tampering uh, with weighing equipment. Uh, weighing equipment that was inspected, approved uh, by both the NSAI and the SFPA in good faith. Uh, so th that's one aspect of this that we need. We need to have more robust ways of, of ensuring uh, that 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 weighing equipment is protected. Uh, we've also gone into considerable uh, um, effort to ensure that we have learned what is state-of-the-art and what are the vulnerabilities of state-of-the-art equipment. And whereas Deputy McLaughlin is right, there is better equipment available now that has within it uh, electronic features that will produce a data log after the event that would let us know if any tampering had been taking place with the weighing equipment. We also have learned in, in, in the journey we've taken to assess this modern equipment is that the state-of-the-art equipment with all these electronic features is still vulnerable to physical tampering. And the accurate weighing of fish can be affected by uh, techniques such as interference with the, the speed, speed of the belt uh, feeding fish uh, to, to the weighing uh, or the, 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 the way the, the machinery is set up. Uh, we've even learned that uh, in the event that you are using systems that might be dewatering fish using fans, that you have to take care that that in itself doesn't put a, a distorting effect on the on the load cells. So we agree entirely with you. We're looking for a transparent system that we can have confidence in. Uh, there are challenges there. There are opportunities there through more modern equipment, but they certainly don't close off all the, the issues that we're facing where we might be dealing with, okay. and it is a sub subset of the industry okay. who are determined to circum circumvent the thank you. Thank regulations. You, thank you, Mr. Kinney. I want to move on. Yeah, thank you, I, have other yeah. I have a good few other uh, deputies and senators who want to ask questions. Um, Deputy Brown. Uh, look, uh, uh, Deputy McLaughlin covered two of the things there, but just on that last issue on the Kinney Beggs, you were involved in the initial, or initially involved in the terms of reference, the planning and the design of the system. Yet you're coming on now saying it wasn't, it isn't up to scratch in that, and you've refused to authorise the system. Why is that? Like, and um, coming back to one of the other things that Deputy McLaughlin raised there, surely it's a crazy uh, situation when the fishing industry itself is being denied the details of the European Commission audit. Especially when it has such devastating impact on uh, fisheries and their livelihoods. <clears throat> We've had a number of uh, fishing organisations talk, been talking to us and have, they've questioned the dual role that you have in terms of both uh, fishery quality and control. And 
do you think that as an organisation you're capable of appropriately carrying out the many roles that have been outlined in your opening statement? Uh, the Irish Fish, Fish Processors and Experts Association have more or less said that you have taken your eye off the quality aspect uh, of this in terms of weighing catches at pier side. The, w, uh, the PwC report also raises concerns about the organisational capacity of the SFPA and specifically in relation to the need to reset the dial in relation to the strategic plan of the, the organisation and its interactions with the staff and the stakeholders. Go my good uh, career like that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Deputy Brown. Thank you very much, Deputy Brown. Um, so I suppose um, th there's two things here, I think, just to, just to kind of give a, a clarif uh, slight clarification. I think, Deputy Brown, you're speaking of a new device that was built on the pier in Killybegs, whereas I think Deputy McLaughlin was talking about the factory weighing. Um, so just if it's OK, what I'll do is speak about the, um, the weighing device um, that's on the pier. Um, so... Again, we, we can't comment at this stage on this weighing equipment on the pier in Kitty Beggs as it's currently subject to legal action um, uh, on the part of the equipment owners. However, we have followed up with the Commission on concerns that the Commission has expressed regarding this particular equipment, and we await further information from the Commission at this time. So that's um, what I can say on, on, the, on the first matter that you've raised there um, about the weighing um, equipment that's currently on the pier in Kitty Beggs. In relation um, to the mandate of the SFPA and um, in relation to the SFPA covering quality and control, in the significant mandate of the SFPA um, that was described and, you know, that I've given in the opening statement and I've gone through earlier um, and I'm conscious of time, um, Cahirlik, so we won't uh, go through it again. Um, just to say that we do have 150 people across the major fishing ports um, that we have colleagues who are fully committed to fulfilling the extensive remit. We are audited on all aspects of our work and um, we are discussing one particular audit outcome here but in other areas um, we've been audited and we don't have um, significant issues but we'll continue um, within the SFPA um, to always um, learn and um, always uh, work towards improving um, and doing a better job. In relation um, to your final uh, question and apologies um, Deputy Brown if I've skipped over anything I just don't want to I'm just conscious of the of the time of the committee. Um, PwC organisation review, and I'm, I'm glad that you grazed it. So the SFPA was set up, um, and as an organisation, both the remit um, uh, has grown, the staffing numbers have grown. So in 2019, um, we commissioned a capability review of the organisation. Um, I have um, here... Um, Ms. Loch Nan, um, who's the deputy uh, or who's uh, director of transformation with the SFPA. The key um, things that we've undertaken were the setting up of an advisory board and the appointment of director of transformation. And if it's okay, I'd like to invite Ms. Loch Nan to talk about the other work that's under, being undergone within the organisation from the capability review. Thank you, Dr. Steele. Thank you, Deputy Brown, for your question. Um, so, from the outset, it's, it's important for me to state that the um, organisation fully accepts the recommendations made in the report. And my role in the organisation is to work with the really hardworking and committed people that are in the organisation and that accept the need for change to deliver on those 46 recommendations. So, in terms of those pieces, what we have is, is a number of different pillars around which those recommendations are based. We're working through those recommendations. Um, and as we speak, uh, 20, a total of tw 26 recommendations are underway. Seven have been delivered and, and 15 have yet to commence. My role is, is to work, as I say, with colleagues across the organisation, not just to implement those recommendations, but to deliver on the objectives of those, the underlying objectives of those recommendations. Thank you. Uh, Senator Lombard. Thank you.
Thank you, Chair. I'd like to welcome the witnesses and thank them for their opening statements, which I read there this evening. Um, very helpful. Uh, I'll be very brief because I realise there's other speakers. Can I ask about the actual responsibility the authority has regarding the human health in, to ensure that fish product that lands on the pier is appropriate? Um, I'm aware the new practice now is going to be icing and de-icing them to take out of boxes, literally de-ice them back into boxes again. The analogy used to me was basically um, like it's like milking cows back in the 60s inside in the stall. Can I get your views, um, Doctor, if you could, regarding that issue itself, regarding the human health of product itself and how you believe, is it effective, is it appropriate, is it the way forward? Thank you very um, much. Um, we haven't um, had the pleasure of meeting, so um, I'll just address that question first, and I think it is um, you know, a very um, significant uh, question. I think the first thing to be aware of is that the sampling plans are still in place. So this means that the full catch um, does not have to be weighed in um, all situations, and that there are sampling plans where parts of the catch um, can be weighed. The responsibility um, for food safety is obviously with food business operators. And the key things is ensuring that unloading and landing equipment that comes into contact with the fisheries products is constructed of material that's easy to clean and disinfect, maintained in a good state of repair and cleanliness, that there's an avoidance of contamination of fishery products during the unloading and landing. Um, so this um, would mean um, that you would work as quickly as possible to move them into ice and not using um, equipment and practices that cause unnecessary damage to the fish. The crew members have to have a reasonable standard of hygiene and prevent contamination of fish or fishery products through contact with any open wounds or sores. Um, and the ice that's being used to chill or the fishery products must be made from either potable water or clean seawater. So when we're looking at this, the onus is on the operator, but obviously um, within the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority, uh, one of the um, key areas that we often work on is in promotion of compliance. So there has been work and uh, there will be a frequently asked questions document that's going up and um, there will be discussion with members of the industry and um, we have already um, met uh, with many people in the industry we are meeting with the fish buyers and we are um, working with a group of the industry in relation to these questions so we will have information on our website we will have consultation and working with the industry but the main thing just to make you aware of is that the sampling plans are in position um, um, which means that it isn't every single box of fish um, that has to be emptied. It's as per the, the sampling plans that were agreed in 2012, they're still in place. Um, so I hope that um, gives you some assurance of the seriousness that we're taking on this and the working that we're doing with the industry. Um, and I suppose I just, I want to, at this stage, um, uh, you know, just pause and say, we're dealing um, in Ireland with an industry that we find in many port areas is um, largely compliant. Um, the industry, uh, when hit with the news of the control plan, um, there has been incredible engagement with us and working with us with industry suggestion of solutions. I just would like to praise um, and thank the many people who've been engaging with us and working with us on this. Um, so thank you very much for that. Okay. Can I ask about the terminology of a serious infringement and where that is actually related to regarding, I think it was last July's meeting of um, the European Fisheries element um, of the European Parliament. Like, we have a slight issue regarding the definition between, between member states. Like, there seems to be no actual defined, nay, or defined what is a serious infringement. Can I get clarity regarding is there any common ground between the member states regarding that actual terminology itself, that actual de definition of a serious infringement? 
Okay. I'm, um, I don't have the legislation in front of me, um, so, but there is definitions of what is serious infringement in the legislation. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is discuss it with you afterwards um, because um, to understand where the actual issues are and then we can go into the detail in the legislation um, because I'm always very nervous of quoting from legislation that I don't have in front of me. But my um, understanding is that the legislation defines what are serious infringements and I'm just unsure of what you're referring to there in relation to the differences between the member states. I'm just conscious uh, on your first question there, I just as we finished, um, uh, I think uh, Mr. Keneen wanted to come in. I'm not sure if you want to come in on serious infringements. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Cyril. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, what I wanted to come in on in, in particular was your comment with regard to uh, human health risks arising out of the new arrangements in place for the weighing of fish before uh, transport. So I think it's it's worth worthwhile taking note of the sampling plans, which uh, greatly reduce uh, the amount of fish that has to be actually weighed. Um, and the SFPA will be doing everything to facilitate and to promote compliance with the requirement uh, with, with, with buyers and, and, and fishers. Uh, and to that effect, we would be uh, supporting uh, EU funding for the purchase of suitable scales and, and other equipment and so on. We've had uh, discussions with our control partners in the NSA on calibration issues and, and, and bringing this equipment online for, for the practitioners in the, in the industry. So there's, there's no doubt there is a risk that the quality of the fish may be affected by what I regard as extra handling. Uh, but I would like to assure the, the sensor that it wouldn't come to the point, uh, to my knowledge anyway, that uh, you would be talking about a risk to, to human health from the rising of the fish. But I, I would, just in closing, uh, Chairman, just say that this particular issue actually points to the value of the dual role of the SFPA, where there's a depth of knowledge in the organisation with regard to uh, quality, and the handling of fish and the preservation of the cold chain and the protection of public health right across the board. And equally, that's linked to our role in monitoring uh, uh, illegally IUU caught fish that are coming on the market, where they would be certified as compliant with that regulation and also be uh, eligible for export certification as might be required to third countries. So the, the dual role, as I might loosely call it in the statute, uh, serves the Irish industry very well to have um, an, an organisation that, that has the, the knowledge in both areas, both in the, the environmental impact of the catching and the proper management and production on the market of the quality seafood product. Yeah, okay. uh, I, yeah that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Thank O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and uh, thank you uh, to the uh, witnesses and contributors so far for um, your opening statements and uh, contributions so far. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yes, Christy, yeah. Very good. So I just wanted to describe um, a situation. Uh, I recently visited Union Hall. I was invited down to the pier there uh, to witness firsthand um, how the fish is weighed, how it's, how it's brought to the uh, plant um, and how it's, it's processed. So they very carefully talk me through and walk me through uh, the process as it would be with the control pan plan in place. Now, Union Hall, as you will know, is mainly smaller uh, white fish boats. So what happens is um, the boxes of fish, which are already iced, are um, hoisted directly into the, the back of a lorry and brought straight up to the uh, uh, processing plant, which is only a couple of hundred metres away. Um, now, if I'm not doing it justice, it's because I'm, I, you know, I've only, I was only walked through it once. But you get the point. It's brought, it's, it's brought straight up to the plant. Um, it is uh, de-iced. It is weighed. It is weighed accurately, uh, with transparency, with full traceability. It's labelled. It's uh, boxed and labelled and, and put it into the back of um, uh, a truck again to be uh, distributed uh, wherever it's in, the intended market is. So to me, that makes complete sense. It's safe. Um, it's transparent, traceable, as I've just said. 
So after that, they uh, walk me through what the process will be with the removal of the control plan and the weighing of the fish on the pier in Union Hall. Now, bear in mind these whitefish boats, you could be talking anything between 10, 15 different species, uh, even more. So this idea of the sampling plans will not work in those situations because in some cases it's five boxes of one species, eight boxes of another, three boxes of another, 12 boxes of another. So it simply will not work. So these, uh, without the control plan, the boxes of fish, which are iced at the time, are, are landed on the pier, de-iced, weighed, re-iced, back into lorry and up to the plant, which is only a couple of hundred meters away. So you can straight away see how that makes absolutely no sense. Um, it will lead to health and safety issues, as has been alluded to already, because there's you're spending more time on the pier in uh, what are exposed, always in, in exposed, um, uh, in situations where you're exposed to the elements. There is, uh, unfortunately, um, and there may be an issue with the um, uh, quality of the fish. Uh, we, we, we pride ourselves in the incredible fresh quality of our fish. But if you have fish that because of this process, because of a situation where the control plan is removed and they're now being weighed on the pier and they're being exposed to the elements, whether it's severe sun um, or, or whether the, whether the elements may be in a, a hot day, you know, that, that's going to have a massive impact. And finally, it, the, the key to um, our fishing sector and, and the, the, the pride that we have in the quality of our fish is getting it to market quickly. This slows things down by hours upon hours. So it makes absolutely no sense. And my first question is on that, and I have a, a series of questions and ask them one after the other, and you can come back to me then. Do you accept that in the instance that I've just described to you there on Union Hall Pier, where it's uh, a white fish with a whole variety of different species, uh, that weighing on pier simply will not work because of the lack of infrastructure that we have on our most of our piers and the fact that in most situations, uh, the processing plants are a variety of distance away from the pier itself. So that's the first thing. Do you accept that what has been forced on the fishing sector right now with the withdrawal of the control plan cannot work in most instances. Secondly, and um, Susan, you mentioned there at the start of your present, or in your presentation, you kind of asked the question, how do we get to this point? Um, well, I'll, look, I'll put this quote to you from the opening statement, which will be read out, or which, which we'll have uh, in the next session. And this is from the Irish Fish Processors and Exporters Association. They say, a subsequent administrative inquiry was required by the EU Commission to be carried out. The SFPA undertook this inquiry during 2019, and again, no input was sought from us as a sector. So I guess that brings me to the to the uh, point. Do uh, the SFPA accept that the reason we're here and the reason we're at this point is because of a consistent lack of consultation with the sector and with the industry, um, which has has led to, to the situation that we we find ourselves on? Because that is a direct quote. Uh, from representatives of the Irish fish processors. Um, two more questions. Will you commit to bringing back uh, a control plan or, or making every effort in consultation, full consultation with the industry to bring back a control plan with in factory weighing? Um, as, as I've just outlined there, um, in instances like Union Hall, it's fully traceable, uh, fully transparent uh, and far more efficient. And you mentioned, uh, uh, Dr. Steele, in your statement that, or in a response to um, one of the deputies, that you do intend, or uh, you will look at bringing back a control plan and in factory weighing for uh, shellfish and whitefish sector. Can we get a timeline uh, on this, please, as to when that might be happening? And finally, final question is, in the interim, you have situations like I've just described to you there, where fishers, processors simply do not have the equipment at hand for on pier weighing. What will be done in the interim? Thank you, Chair. Okay, Deputy Sullivan, over to the witnesses. Thank you um, very much. And um, I, I think that it's really helpful to describe um, what happens in Union Hall, because it's very, it's obviously very close to where we're based in Clonakilty, um, and it gives a, a very good image um, of what's been occurring. So the, there's a number of things um, that you've raised here. So 
The key thing is that this is an EU decision. Um, it isn't. Uh, it is removal of a derogation um, that Ireland had with the removal of the control plan. This decision from the EU does involve significant changes to weighing practices, and the SFPA are working um, to ensure the industry can introduce these efficiently and in a way that assures compliance with the regulations. So we are um, working um, with uh, Union Hall um, through, through the Clonakilty Port Office. Um, we are looking at the use of the, the sampling plan, but the onus is on the operators um, to weigh the fish. Do um, so. Then, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to skip to um, question three in relation to the control plan. So, in relation um, to the control plan and the impact of the control plan on um, the demersal and shellfish industries, yes, we have already committed um, and will be consulting with the industry in relation to control plans for those. In factory weighing um, for the demersal and shellfish industry is, um, or for the pelagic industry, are slightly different in relation to um, the audit and the administrative inquiry. Um, but yes, just to say that there is a commitment, but there is not going to be a fast solution. The SFPA will have to work on the uh, new control plan. This will have to be submitted um, under EU legislation. And the minimum time frame, if there are no issues and there are no further audits required um, from the Commission, would be a minimum of two months. So just um, to you know, be very um, uh, open at the moment, there isn't um, a change going to happen at any point soon. Um, weighing uh, will have to occur um, at landing. If I go back then to question two in relation to the administrative inquiry and um, the question that you ask in relation to input from the sector, it doesn't work like that in relation to administrative inquiry. The administrative inquiry um, looked um, for historic detail and significant volumes of historic detail in relation to landing figures um, landing um, declarations um, and uh, other materials in relation. It wouldn't have been appropriate um, to look um, for input from the industry um, in relation to the administrative inquiry. Um, it was looking at data that was stored by the SFPA, and it's a very significant undertaking um, with a significant amount of data um, being submitted um, to the Commission for their examination. And I suppose the other um, side to be aware of um, is that the administrative inquiry is not complete. Um, the removal of the control plan is the first decision that we've seen from the Commission. Um, there will be other engagements with the Commission um, in relation uh, to other aspects coming out of the administrative inquiry, um, and we will communicate and deal with those as they arise. Um, so just to be aware of, of that in relation to it. Is um, I think uh, one of the questions that you've asked here is in relation to consultation um, with the industry. The SFPA has always committed um, to consult and to meet with the industry. We meet with the consultative committee. At times, the relationship between a regulator and the industry um, can uh, be difficult and can be strained, but we have, as an organisation, always met with the industry and counted as a very important part of our work, um, and for me personally, um, counted as one of the most important parts of the work. Um, I don't know, uh, Mr Keneen, if you want to come in at this point on, on those questions. Thank you very much, um, Deputy. Just just a, a couple of brief comments, Deputy O'Sullivan, uh, on, on the questions you've asked. So what you described there, the walkthrough you were given in Union Hall, sounds to me as if they have a best practice system in place there. And as an organisation, the SFK is doing everything to minimise the impact of where we stand at the moment to deal with the, the revocation of the, of the control plan. Part of that strategy is to have... Uh, a mapping uh, in place for the major fishery harbours and for the local authority harbours, such as Union Hall, where we may be able to define a footprint area 
where the fish could come off boats and go to a, a local handling uh, facility or buyer and uh, there would be little or no disturbance to the practice. So we're working on that at the moment, gathering information and, and getting it in place. Uh, from the consultations we've had with different uh, sectors of the industry, it's very clear that uh, there has been a huge impact on the revocation of the uh, capacity to wear pelagic, to weigh pelagic fish in the factories. That's a huge impact. And there are huge challenges there to work through given the audit findings. But we're also hearing a very strong message from uh, the more and, and small scale fishers who will be landing into uh, uh, landing places that won't have the benefit of uh, much infrastructure, if any at all. And we are looking, we are solution orientated to see what we can do with that. So we are working hard to try and get over uh, where we stand at the moment. Uh, the uh, Commission decision to revoke the control plan was not uh, signaled to us um, that when it was happening, we were not consulted with it, but we are certainly uh, uh, using a lot of the resources of the organisation to react and to support the industry to get through where we are at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Steele. And, and Dr. Kniff, just one more question, Chair. Well, it was, it was in the original suite of questions, and that's in relation to uh, Dr. Steele. You mentioned a period of, of roughly two months, maybe, before a control plan could be brought back in for um, uh, the whitefish and, and shellfish sector, um, if I understand you correctly. In the interim, um, they're in serious situation they're they're in um they can't work it's a lot of what they do is not workable what what measures are going to be introduced in the inter interim to help them out okay thank you um deputy o'sullivan it's a minimum of two months um so under the legislation it's a two-month consultation period and that is if we're in a position um, where it passes um, through Parliament, it, there was a significant delay the last time when the control plans were submitted. So just to be aware, that just don't, uh, not to take it as that. In the interim period, um, we have been working with the industry, and again, just to, to praise the industry, we've been looking at solutions for this. Um, there's been uh, groups buying um, shared weighing scales that they're putting into to, to piers and lockbox is for smaller peers um, and um, again as we were saying earlier there's a huge component of the Irish industry which is extremely compliant and they've been looking at how to comply and how to make this situation work um, so it's to work looking at solutions with them and um, there isn't any um, the, the control plan is gone the weighing has to be in the same way as it was 10 years ago um, at the play at landing and um, we are looking at how we define the landing areas so for some situations that includes the apron area and the pier area but it's to work um, with us um, uh, in order to ensure that, that they are compliant um, is the only step forward. So in the interim period, it's just um, literally to move to um, the new situation um, to have weighing equipment and to put in place um, for quality. I know that it is a change. I know it is a significant change, but I do know um, from many members of the industry who are looking at this and are, um, are looking at how they can work into a compliant situation with it. There won't be a change to this in a short term. Thank you. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Um, Deputy Pringle. Uh, th thank you, Chairman, and I'd like to thank um, uh, Susan Steele and the other members of the SIPA for attendance here. Um, just in relation to um, your own document that you submitted here to the committee, I'd just like to read out one paragraph of it and then just ask a question in relation to it. It just says, it says that Commission identified that the operators did not have in place a weighing system fit for purpose and the audit identified manipulation of the weighing systems. Moreover, although aware of these shortcomings, Ireland did not take appropriate measures to address such compliance, in particular by withdrawing the permission to weigh after transport. Consequently, the control plan does not minimise the risk of systemic, systemic ma manipulation of weighing catches in Ireland and under the declaration of these catches by operators. I take it as in Ireland they mean the SFPA um, uh, in relation to that. So, and I'm sure that at the time the SFPA could have acted in relation to individuals that rather than penalising the whole industry, that you could actually dealt with the individuals rather than... Um, doing a blanket thing like we, we've had now, which has had the effect of making life impossible for everybody. And there's no doubt that any system, no matter what it is, 
somebody will try and manipulate it at some point and you have to deal with the manipulation not deal with the penalise the whole industry and um, do you accept that there's a falling down on behalf of the SFPA in the fact that um, these issues weren't dealt with as on the individual basis that has led to the whole industry being uh, impacted in relation to the changes that have been put in place um, the other question just in relation to um, you have dealt with the questions of, in relation to the white fishing sector which I was going to ask well which you dealt with in the last in the last action um, I just wanted to ask just in relation to the the EU control plan says that all monkfish should be weighed individually in that there, but it doesn't apply to EU registered or UK registered vessels and at Irish ports. So I'm wondering where's the fairness in that and what comments you have in relation to that as well. And also then as well, the um, Irish fishermen are responsible for 1% of infringements under EU law. Um, and I'm just wondering, we, we seem to be subject to the strictest uh, enforcement of anybody and I'm just wondering how do, you, how do you view the enforcement that's taking place in Ireland in relation to the enforcement that's taking place uh, across the EU in relation to uh, fisheries issues um, that's all my questions thanks um, thank you so much, um, Deputy Pringle, and I, I'm, you know, conscious that we're we're eating into time. So, um, you know, I'll I'll be um, as quick as I can in relation um, to these. So, in in relation um, to the manipulation of scales, where there have been cases, and um, the SFPA has prepared cases for the DPP. Um, one case has um, gone through the courts; another case has not gone through the courts. Um, however, um, these cases, in the in the view of the Commission, in the view of the audit, showed a systematic issues within the industry um, that weren't being picked up by the control authorities. So the the question here is yes, um, Deputy Pringle, we did act um, on individual um, basis in relation to those, but the the um, cases and uh, following on um, surveying of ullage ta tables uh, tanks in the vessels showed. Um, systematic issues in the industry and that's where this audit has picked up um, the issues uh, so you've you know I suppose you've you've kind of identified one of the key things that that uh, where the SFPA did act in relation to individual cases but we didn't act in relation um, to uh, what was identified um, by the Commission as systematic issues across the industry um, as I've stated earlier um, we continuously re appraise in the organisation, we continuously learn and we continuously try and develop and do better. Um, so there is learnings for us from, um, obviously, from the entire process. In um, relation um, to monkfish and UK registered vessels in Irish ports, I might just come back to you because I think there's, a, the, the, there's quite a, a bit actually in that question because um, there's part in the sampling plans and just in, in the line of time, if it's OK, Deputy, I'll come back to you afterwards to assure you that for all vessels landing in Irish ports, whatever nationality, they have to weigh prior to transport unless they have first point of sale in France or Belgium where there's a common control programme. Um, but the um, weighing uh, at landing is for all vessels. Um, I think the question monkfish there, and thank you for that. We'll just come back um, with clarity on that because I think to go into the detail would use up a lot of time. In relation um, to 1% infringements um, uh, across the EU um, and strictest enforcement in Ireland, um, I won't comment on, on other member states. Um, all I, I can assure you is that we um, believe in the SFPA um, that sustainable um, fisheries um, underpin the future of our coastal communities. Um, and we believe that in the shared maritime area, um, the work that the SFPA does in regulating this is um, the most important um, work that can be done um, to ensure a future for our generation and for future generations in the coastal communities. And as I've said earlier, um, we're supporting that work by 150 very committed staff, but we're also, um, and I, I, I know that I said it earlier and I'd, I'd like to again, there are um, 
the vast majority of Irish fishers who believe and who, by their actions, um, by being compliant with the common fisheries policy and with the quotas, are acting to develop sustainable fisheries into the future. And I would like to take the opportunity here um, to thank both um, the committed staff in the SFPA, but also to thank compliant fishers around the coast that are giving those low levels of infringements. Um, uh, so that's um, Deputy Pringle to come in there. I don't know if Mr. Uh, Keith will come in afterwards. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, Deputy Pringle. Yes. Yeah, yeah, could you just ask just one brief request? Sorry, I forgot to ask it in the last one. Um, yeah. You said uh, earlier on in response to about white fishing that you would expect that two months would be a new procedure being placed at the very optimistic. It'll probably run out into a year, a year and a half, probably before it happens. But the interim measures that you're putting in place, will how soon will they be in place? because I think that's vitally important. And uh, the interim measures should be in place, I believe, within the next month or so to run onto the period of, that it's uh, accepted. But when will they be in place? Um, I'm afraid, that, and, and again, uh, there are no interim measures. Um, you when said the it, you just have to set it. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. When the derogation is removed, um, the weighing has to be at the point of transport, so at the point of landing. Yeah. So we're just, um, so that has started already from the decision on the 13th of April. And that's why we move very fast to communications with the industries and working um, with the industry um, to ensure that we had a solution. Just conscious Mr. Keneen wants to come oh. in there. Yeah, sorry. Just, sorry. No, I'll have to, I'll have to move on now. Um, you have answered. Because I have the, we've gone well over time. Are you okay, Deputy Pringle? Uh, yeah, well, uh, that wasn't really the answer to that question. Was different to my question was different than the one previously, um, where they said there would be an interim measures would be put in place to ensure that um, while they'll be waiting for the actual approval of the the measures, you said that interim measures would be put in place. I want, would like the interim measures to be put in place as soon as possible, because this approval of this control measure is going to take longer than two months, as you say yourself. Okay, uh, sorry, and um, apologies, because I'll have to just go back over that, but it, it, we're just moved immediately to weighing at landing. Um, so that's, it's, it's, we're in that process at the moment, Deputy Pringle. Yeah. Okay. I'm happy. Chair, sorry. No. So, sorry, Chair, very briefly. Uh, we've left some issues hanging here. We've tried to respond. Sorry, who's uh, speaking? Oh, sorry, Andrew. So, sorry, uh, sorry, yeah. Sorry, sorry I, I just, uh, we will forward, forward our contact details to, to Mr. Higgins, who will circulate them to, to the committee members, and then uh, we're, we're very happy to engage. And we appreciate this is a matter of record, our, our, our appearance over here and so on, uh, but we would take any individual engagement with, with deputies or senators uh, very very seriously and, and be very happy to do so. Okay, thank you very much. On behalf of the committee, I wish to thank Dr Steele, Ms Lucknan and Mr Keneen for their informative contribution. And I propose we suspend the meeting for two minutes um, to allow the other witnesses to join the call. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to apologise to the organisations that have been in, in, in the lobby waiting. We, we get into the hour of your time, but I felt it was important that the members would get the chance to question this FPA extensively, and I didn't want to cut any of the member, members short. So I apologise for that, but I know you were probably, you, I know you were undoubtedly listening to the exchanges, <coughs> and I hope you found them informative um, for, for yourselves. So. I think there was a very um, intensive questioning of the SFPA there um, by all the deputies and senators. So my apologies for easing into, into, easing into your allocated time. For the second session of the meeting, I would like to welcome the following witnesses. Mr. Sean O'Donoghue, CEO, Kitty Beggs Fishermen's Organisation. Mr. Kieran Doherty, Chairman, Kitty Beggs Fishermen's Organisation. Mr. John Lynch, Chairman, Irish South East Fish Producers Organisation. Mr. Cal McHugh, Chairman, Irish Fish Processors and Exporters Association. Mr. Brendan Byrne, CEO, Irish Fish Producers and Exporters Association. Mr. J Mr. John Ward, CEO, Irish Fish Producers Organisation, all joining remotely. And Mr. Patrick Murphy, CEO, Irish South and West Producers Organisation, joining from a witness room in Kildare House. You're all very welcome to the meeting. 
We have received your opening statement, which has been circulated to members. We are limited in our time due to COVID-19, and so the committee has agreed that the opening statement will be taken as read, so we can use the rest of the meeting um, for questions and answers. All opening statements are published on the Oxford's website and publicly available. An important note is in relation to parliamentary privilege. Privileged witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect to the evidence you are to give to the committee. However, you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to the particular matter and you continue to do so. You are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or such a way as to make him or or it identifiable. Participants in the committee meeting from an occasion outside the parliamentary precincts are asked to note that the constitutional protections afforded to those participating but within the parliamentary precincts does not extend to them. No clear guidance can be given on whether or to the extent to which the participation is covered by absolute privilege of a statutory nature. I now invite questions um, from the members. So, um, um, Deputy, Deputy McLaughlin. Thanks, uh, thanks Cahirla. Um, I, I, I have a, a, a number of questions. Um, I, I, the four producer organisations um, who are present today, uh, you would have collectively written to uh, Minister Charlie McConlogue uh, when the SI uh, 318 uh, uh, was was introduced by the Taoiseach Michael Martin on an interim basis uh, in between ministers. Uh, and the four core points uh, still stand, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of this uh, proposed uh, legislation. Um, and I think the thing that I, I want to put to you, maybe if you, if you could all contribute on this, actually, um, the issue of um, that the, the threshold for conviction for most citizens normally is beyond uh, a reasonable doubt. Uh, and that is an onus on uh, the accuser to prove um, uh, the matter. But what we have here is the balance of probabilities. And in, I, I note particularly in the, uh, the submission from the South and West PO that you refer to the, the, um, the way that the UK authorities, when they were members of the European Union, uh, were 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 applying in a similar common law system. So I'd like you to speak, and I know uh, some of your members have taken court cases, been successful in the Supreme Court a number of times. So I want to get that perspective. Uh, that's the, the first question for all of the POs to respond to. Um, second question, I have three. Second question is, uh, this bill only covers Irish and EU flagged vessels. It does not cover UK, Norwegian or Faroese vessels, but a particular concern would be that it doesn't cover UK vessels. So if you could just speak to, to me that appears like there's two drivers on the same road and uh, one can be prosecuted for speeding and the other can't be. That's how it seems to me. So maybe if you could speak to that, that's a, that's a second question. And the third question would be for the Fish Producers and Exporters uh, Association. Uh, obviously, uh, you'll be aware we just uh, had uh, an intensive uh, engagement with the SFPA and you've made a very detailed submission to the committee here. Um, and I, I think that the thing that occurs to me, and I would invite you to speak to this, is that this report has apparently, this is the EU audit of 2018, um, it, it was conducted from 2012 to 2015. This audit has apparently been leaked to at least three national media outlets. Um, and the implications of it are very damning to the reputation of our entire fishing industry and fish producers, yet you haven't had a chance to look at it. You haven't had a chance to see the report be given to you officially, nor the SFPA, SFPA administrative inquiry. Um, so I, I, I essentially invite you to um, outline the reality of the oversight. I've touched on some of it today in the engagement with the SFPA. What is the reality? You, you say, and it's really important uh, in the end of your, towards the end of your submission, and it's up there uh, clearly that you talk about the level of oversight um, 
uh, yeah, Ireland's seafood landings are the most regulated in Europe. Our industry has embraced those controls. We are committed to sustainably manage fisheries and will continue to play our part in protecting our fisheries as long as controls are proportionate, reasonable and pragmatic. So that, so I say it again, Ireland's seafood landings are the most regulated uh, in Europe. Uh, you wouldn't know that from what was leaked and briefed to national media. So I invite you to put in a defence of the industry uh, and to outline your vision uh, for the way forward and what needs to be done in the immediate term uh, to address the serious uh, impact of these uh, the, the rev revocation of the EU control uh, plan. Okay, thank you. Okay, over to the witnesses. Um, who, wants to, who wants to respond there? Mr. Donner. Mr. Donoghue, you're on. Is it Mr. Donoghue? You're on mute. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me, Chair? Yeah, Please. I can hear you now, uh, Mr. Donoghue. Yeah. 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 Is it okay if I uh, if I kick off on behalf of the uh, the four POs and particularly uh, to address uh, Deputy McLaughlin's questions, which are are really pertinent in terms of the uh, uh, this new bill in terms of giving penalty points to. Uh, to masters or to skippers, as we would know them, of uh, of uh, fishing vessels, in addition to the uh, to the owners, and I, I have to say this at the at the very beginning because the the industry has got accused here that we are we are going after these things to try as uh, a delaying tactic, and there could be nothing further from the truth. We have uh, always accepted that there's an, an onus on Ireland under EU law to have penalty points in, in place for both the owners of fishing vessels and for the skippers of fishing vessels. And the reason that the, we've ended up in this mess is that the, uh, the, the, this minister and previous ministers have ignored uh, what we are trying to tell them. So just uh, just in relation to, to uh, Deputy McLaughlin's questions and the, yes, the four POs uh, put forward uh, four very key points in terms of the previous uh, 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 Penalty points for owners uh, uh, over the over the years. Unfortunately, uh, the minister has now uh, copied and pasted all of those uh, provisions, which are an anathema to uh, to us, and really do have to be uh, uh, to to be addressed. And be, before I deal with the 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 specific issue about the the burden of proof. I think it is important for the committee to be aware that the Commission or the Minister this time round under the EU uh, uh, regulation has quite a lot of latitude in terms of how he's going to uh, implement penalty points for serious infringements of the common fisheries policy for masters of vessels. He didn't have the same latitude for uh, for owners, but he does have it here. He has saw fit in the bill that's been published not to do that, and we're really mirroring what is there as such. In terms of the of the burden of of proof. Uh, uh, the, the Supreme Court uh, already found that there was no impediment to actually having uh, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, in relation to, uh, to, to, to this. Unfortunately, uh, the minister uh, has put in this balance of prob probability, uh, balance of probabilities as such, Ignoring the fact that uh, the if the if the uh, the master uh, uh, or the skipper gets a, a significant number of penalty points here, his livelihood is taken away from him forever and a day, and a day. So he no can no longer uh, be a skipper of a of a fishing vessels. So we have to have a situation where if you are taking away somebody's li livelihood, it, it has to be, be beyond a reasonable doubt. And that sort of brings me to, the, to a key point that is really ridiculous in the, in the, in the master's bill, again, is that uh, you can, the skipper can only appear 
to the High Court on the point of uh, uh, on the point of law, and I mean that is given that uh, his livelihood could be taken away. That is not uh, 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 is not fair uh, uh, and equitable. And to really rub salt in the wounds and uh, uh, is that even even if he's successful on the point of law in the High Court the penalty points still stay on his licence. I mean, can you imagine telling somebody that has challenged a speeding offence uh, in the courts and won it, that, oh, by the way, you're still going to have to have your penalty points on you for, uh, for, the, uh, for the three years. This does not stack up uh, in, any, uh, in any democracy and has to be, uh, uh, to be changed. And I think the, the other point... Uh, 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 Deputy McLaughlin, that you you mentioned is really relevant here. Is that the 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 bail as it stands, and indeed the EU uh, legislation, only applies to uh, to EU flagged vessels. So, uh, in the new scenario which uh, which uh, which breaks it, you you will have all the Irish vessels which they have done for for decades. Uh, fishing alongside UK uh, counterparts, we will be subject to penalty points, and they won't as such. And just in case anybody is uh, is, is suggesting, well, there are other measures for uh, for UK vessels that doesn't stack up because the the penalty points are are in addition to the other uh, measures as such. So we we have the cornerstone of the control regulation being thrown out the the door here with this uh, this bill and it needs to be if there is to be penalty points uh, for skipper we have to have a level playing field uh, for for fishers is fishing in the same uh, 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 fishing ground, and I think the one final thing that uh, that um, the has been continuously said uh, by the minister, and I've seen it in his uh, recent uh, uh, the, uh, recently at, at your at your committee, is that the uh, uh, allowing the uh, the uh, the um, the appeal to the high court or not taking off the penalties was delaying the system. Well, that is totally inaccurate because. From the very beginning, and I'm talking here going back a number of years, we have said that uh, we we fully accept uh, that the uh, if somebody gets uh, penalty points, they stay on their on their license or on the master's registration until uh, if they are successful in the high court, then they're removed, but not before. So there can be no excuse about we not implementing this uh, uh, immediately. So I, t I hope, uh, Deputy, I've covered your two uh, questions uh, in relation to this. And we, we have it uh, uh, set out as well in, the, uh, in our opening statement. Thanks. OK. De Deputy Collins. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. I'll try and keep uh, my questions uh, to a minimum, uh, a bit different to the last time. Um, you know, t thanks to our witnesses, Patrick and Murphy and Sean, and, and, and there's so many, John and Carl, in fairness, I hope I don't miss out, there's Bernard as well, and, uh, and John Ward. Um, just in relation to um, the SFP, who have been on previously, said they're consulting um with 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 uh, uh, consulting with the industry let's see as such and that's not reading right in my mind and i'll tell you why in relation to the weighing prices that we have now because i see here in front of me that at four o'clock on the 16th of april um nobody seemed to be aware of what was going to happen at 5 p.m uh 5 p.m um uh, and 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 what ended up as a massive crisis was put before the, the fishermen. And is that right? Were you consulted about this? Did you know anything about it? Were you aware it was going to happen? Um, and that's one question. The next one is, um, do you accept that um, it is, you know, the way it is happening at the moment, and, the, you know, there could be five, 6,000 tonnes of fish coming into a place like Castle Bear, but it could be many more. I, I'm talking about fish coming into Union Hall, uh, coming to Baltimore, coming to inshore and, and pelagic fishermen. Do you accept this could lead to serious amounts of landings going elsewhere in relation to, I suppose, to the bigger fishermen going to the Norways, the Shetlands or Scotland? Is that a possibility? It's, it's, I've been told that's a possibility and I'd, I'd appreciate your uh, comments on it. Um, and it looks to me as if there's going to be no budget here. I try to 
get a little space today. It's not happening. And uh, is there any chance that um, they will restore this to factory uh, wings as, you know, uh, as, as a, even if it's a short term solution, uh, are they, you know, they're saying they're solution orientated. Have they approached me on what solutions they think might uh, resolve this crisis? And 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 also just uh, briefly there, I see just a few points of information about the SAP and the board is made up of three internal employees. Is this, in your view, highly unusual for a state agency? Look, I better stop at that because I could ask you hundred questions, but you won't have a chance to answer all of them. Okay, uh, Patrick. Mur pa Patrick Murphy is looking to get in there from the witness side. Uh, thanks very much, Chair, and I, I wish to thank the committee for allowing us to come before you again to discuss these, these serious issues that are affecting our industry. The last time we spoke uh, with your good selves, it was to highlight our fears of losing 20% of our natural resource that uh, it would be given away on us. And this, on top of that, um, it, 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 to be honest with you, it, it's 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 crushing. It's crushing for our industry. Um, it's very hard for our coastal communities. And I understand the SFPA have a job to do, but um, we don't agree in the way that it's being applied. Um, we've um, pointed out in our um, submissions that there has to be a procedure here. There has to be time to lead into this because it's it's the dam Damocles sword has come across our heads now and it's, and it's been used. And this is happening on the piers all over the coastline now and it, it has immediate effects. And to say that we're consulting the industry, uh, as Deputy Collins says, I, I don't know what the definition of consulting is um, to the SFPA or your good selves, but for me, it, it consulting isn't just being told what's happening and that's it. Um, it. It should expand to actually looking for solutions and sitting down to see if we're here. And we've spent a good few meetings trying to put that across to the SFPA. And our, our biggest question is, why did they accept this report? This is a damning report. And and they accepted this highlighting their own incompetencies here. And, and that's a hard word to say. And I know they're not here to defend themselves, but that's the reality of the situation. Uh, they accepted this report and it was they who, who uh, subjected the, the fishing scales and, and everything that was there as was identified by Mr. Pringle, Deputy Pringle. They were in this in 2012. They put forward this um, request for revoking uh, of what was there. And uh, the circumstances haven't changed. So being the competent authority for the quality of fish as well too, uh, I find it incredible that anybody could stand over that taking fish out of a box, a nice and chilled box, putting it into another box that may not be chilled, um, looking for ice on piers, that there are no facilities there for ice to re-ice this fish and put it back in. And uh, as Deputy um, Christopher O'Sullivan said, uh, Union Hall are very lucky to have a factory that's a couple of hundred metres up the road, even though it's not, as uh, uh, Mr Kinnean said, um, currently in the roadmap plan to allow it to, to, to be weighed above a couple of hundred metres away. It kind of points to the lunacy of, of what we're talking about here. And, and this has to be addressed. We're coming back to Deputy McLaughlin's questions. Yes, the UK, uh, it's very simple. We, we didn't object to these penalty points being brought in. We tried and saw it many, many times as an industry to meet with the minister and, and those who are drafting this legislation to see if it could be brought in in a fair and transparent manner, especially when it was defeated in our courtrooms to say that the fair procedures weren't being followed here. And again, consultation, there was little or none. Uh, and so we are in the same situation that we are now. We're scratching our heads and wondering, uh, is it is it actually possible that we as a country is going to allow the, the balance of probabilities decide somebody's future and their right to make a living in this country? And that if it goes into the Supreme Court or the High Court, that they're exonerated and they still lose the ability to have those... Um, like, I'm not going to make light of this, but I want this to be understood. If this was a debt penalty and a man was prosecuted and sentenced to debt and he would did to the courtrooms or exonerated, he'd still be executed under this law outside of the courtrooms. That's what it means. Maybe not in the same uh, analogy, but we have to get this across. This is not fair procedures. We have requested that we get the same ability to defend our names and our good names inside the court of law as any other citizen of the state. We understand the administrative sanctions and if they follow a court conviction like any other citizen in the land, surely we should be afforded the same rights. Um, 
So the loss forever, if you're like, again, I don't like using these analogies, but I think they have to be used to get the severity of what we're talking about here. If a murderer goes into prison, he will be not be there for life. He will eventually come out. He'll be pardoned. Where under this legislation, as Sean pointed out, if you lose your rights, you'll never get them back. Time doesn't erase it. No matter what you do or change, we'll never erase it. There is no other avenue to rectify that situation. You're guilty for the rest of your life and you're punished for the rest of your life. It's it's incredible. Um, there, I, 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 there's so much that I'd like to say, Chair, but it, I would be unfair to take the floor for too much longer. So I, I hope I've addressed the, the things. And uh, I, I thank the deputies for their questioning. I, I listened and they were well versed. The questions were very pertinent, and I would have been happier if the, there were some clearer answers given to the very simple questions that were given, that, that were asked. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, Deputy O'Sullivan. Thanks, Chair. No, Patrick, I'll, I'll give you another shot to take the floor, so you can you can continue your soliloquy there now in a second. Uh, look, I, I guess I know most of you were probably watching and, and uh, tuned into the uh, previous session with the SFPA, so I guess there's an opportunity here to. Um, answer uh, and uh, maybe clarify and maybe correct or, or, or agree with <laughs> some of the statements made by the SFP, which, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, Deputy Collins already touched on, uh, you know, the SFPA said they do engage extensively with the sector. I think you've just answered that. Um, a question, uh, it was alluded that, you know, in, in the whitefish sector, for example, going back to a situation where they're weighing on their peers, that that's just a return to what was happening uh, 10 years ago. It's my understanding that that wasn't happening 10 years ago and that actually wasn't the situation and that the fish has always been weighed in plants um, or in, in markets or whatever whatever it would be. So I'd just like clarification on that. Um, whichever uh, witness uh, can answer the question in terms of are you confident uh, with the data that the, the SFPA uh, sent to the, the Commission in terms of when this audit was being carried out. Um, and for you, Patrick, um, if you would, I, I'd love an opportunity for you to, in as clear and as um, to emphasize as much as possible um, what needs to happen um, with the fallout from the Brexit trade agreement, what it means for uh, the Irish fishing sector, and essentially what needs to happen now. Uh, in terms of burden sharing or approach to burden sharing um, and sharing with other EU countries. So if you, I know that's something that you'd, I'd like another opportunity to, to hear you speak on that. And I think you should be given the opportunity to um, clarify that further. So I hope those questions are clear enough. Okay. Some other witnesses I have to bring in first, um, Christo. So um, Mr. Cal McHugh was looking to answer there uh, from the witnesses and so is uh, Mr. Lynch. Mr. McHugh. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I'm just uh, actually uh, sharing the room here with Benton Byrne, our CEO, who actually was raising his hand. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just in relation to the question asked by Deputy McLaughlin, and in fairness to Deputy McLaughlin, you in your earlier uh, question to the SFPA outlined the robustness of the control measures that are in place right across the sector. But before I go into the detail of the answer, we have to address the reality of where we find ourselves as processors and exporters. Our entire world has been thrown upside down by the removal of the control plan. The control plan brought certainty to us as processors and exporters. Article 61.1 brought a level playing field. That was the derogation to weigh within our factories. We're one of seven countries in the EU that can do that. Historically, that has to happen in Ireland because of the location of our factories. So Article 61.1 is an instrument of fairness that creates a level playing field for us as fish processors and exporters. That's the purpose of that article. The earlier witnesses from the SFPA give a very shocking to me misrepresentation of the facts of how processors and exporters are. We are the most regulated, most controlled, of all fishers right throughout Europe, with no exception. Our record is exemplary over the last 10 years. And yet you have this audit of 2018, which none of us have seen sight of. You have an administrative inquiry 
of 2019, which none of us have seen sight of. And you have at least 15 different sets of leaks that emanated from somewhere that accuse us of all things and most importantly, are destroying the Irish fish sector through misinformation. No other nation would tolerate what has been inflicted on the Irish fishing community over the past six months in terms of what has gone on here. We in our paper have identified that we have to get a way forward. But before we do that, let's deal with the reality of what we have heard from the SFPA. The SFPA are a flawed entity. I'm not just saying that. The Wolf Report of 2012 stated that. PricewaterhouseCooper of 2020 stated that. And the greater part of the problem that we find ourselves in at present is through the incompetence of the SFPA as a regulatory authority. The control plan brought certainty to us for processors and exporters. What's been talked about now is effectively creating a Chinese wet market on every pier and harbour in the country, where the food that's going into the food chain is open to the elements, be that sun, be that rain, wind, or be it the foul above our heads. No other country would tolerate this. Yet it's been foisted on us through two audits or an audit and an administrative inquiry that we have not seen sight of. And I take exception to the earlier speaker that said an administrative inquiry cannot be released to the general public. That's factually incorrect. It was confirmed to me that under Article 4 of the same regulation that that information can be released at the discretion of the minister. So we need to seriously have a discussion of where we're going with fishing. For too long, the Irish fishing sector has, refused, has failed to get a political voice. But we have crossed the Rubicon and we're in an unprecedented situation where Brexit has inflicted 20% of uh, cuts to our quota, which already was a small quota, but now as processors, we're not even allowed to function in the way that we have functioned with certainty since the foundation of our businesses. I want to address three sections of this. In terms of shellfish, it's grossly unfair to have shellfish included in the removal of this control plan because they're non-quota, they weren't part of the control plan for weighing, and yet they have been forced to weigh under the elements on piers and harbours right throughout the country. There is no basis for that, and it has to stop. In terms of whitefish and pelagic, both those were subject to the derogation. I seriously question the weight of evidence that has been suggested by the SFPA that's in this yet unseen audit and yet unseen administrative inquiry. I think if we got full sight of that, there would be a greater body of evidence against the incompetence of the regulatory authority than us as fishers. So, Chairman, I thank you for your indulgence. Okay. But I want to say one further thing, and that's about due process of where we've got ourselves here. Under Article 102 of the 2009 regulations, and I want to read this in, because I believe, and Deputy Collins was right, he said within one hour on the, third, on the 16th of April, everything had changed and everything was turned on its head. Deputy Collins is 100% right, but that should not have happened. There was no transitionary arrangement made by the EU or this national government to protect us. But under Article 102.4, and I'll read it, if an administrative inquiry referred to in paragraph 2 does not lead to the removal of the irregularities or of the Commission identifies shortcomings in the control system of a member state, during the verifications of the autonomous inspections referred to in Articles 98 and 99, or in the audit referred to in Article 100, the Commission shall establish an action plan with the member state. The member state shall take the necessary measures to implement the action plan. We were not afforded an action plan. We were not afforded a transitionary period. 
We were afforded nothing. We were thrown out into the proverbial deep waters and let cut loose. Thanks. Thank and you. I'm asking this committee okay, thank to you. stand up for fishing. OK. Um, Deputy Brown. Uh, Look, I can assure Patrick and the rest, like anybody being accused of anything, uh, the fisheries should get due process, and that's only a natural course of justice. And just to assure him is also that we as committee members, and I'd say I speak for everybody, that leaks going on uh, are totally unacceptable as well, especially when they, you're telling us that they're not even communicating with yourselves. Yeah, look at there's only just three quick things uh, that I went to Cahillock. <clears throat> One is for the Killy Beggs uh, contingent. You heard the reply we got from the SFA earlier about the weighing uh, system in Killy Beggs. They're saying that there's legal issues around the weighing system there and the equipment. We've been led to believe that they were. Uh, really involved in the installing of that equipment. Could you give us just uh, your feelings on that? For the Irish fish processors and the exporters, you made it quite clear that the SFA, as far as you're concerned, just can't handle the remit that it's being given in the terms of fishing control and that they've taken their eye off the quality aspect. Is it your view that they've done it deliberately to focus on their attention someplace else? And that's why there's so much secrecy in that in it, because the commission audit, it's just crazy that when it affects so many families and fishers like yourselves, that you can't even access the report. And just finally then, could you give us a, an idea that when temperatures start to increase, how large an impact is it going to have on uh, your catches when you go through an open weighing process? Or okay. Mr. Lynch, I know you're looking to get in there. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Um, just on the earlier um, question from Deputy O'Sullivan on um, what happened prior to 2012. Prior to 2012, he's absolutely correct in saying that the fish was weighed in the factories or in the markets or auction halls all around the country. Um, in very limited circumstances where there was um, um, recovery measures for, um, I think, cod stock comes to mind on one occasion where a small percentage of that um, fish would have been weighed on the pier. But unlike the, the, the um, situation now where um, scales have to be provided by the um, agent doing the, doing, the, doing the selling of the fish, at that time the scales and the weighing was performed by the SFPA as it was a uh, part of um stock recovery program. Um, other than that, the fish has always been weighed at the, at the point of sale in the factory or auction halls. Um, this is really, um, this, this, this withdrawal of this derogation is really disastrous for, um, for the demersal sector, for all sectors it's disastrous. For the demersal and shellfish sector where they are um, landing smaller amounts of fish and landing in them um, boxes that are um, packed um, uh, <clears throat> packed uh, under uh, controlled um, conditions on the vessel with uh, refrigeration and um, ice and um, plenty of uh, water and, on board for, for, for uh, washing. When, when the fish is put onto the pier, you no longer have these um, facilities immediately to hand, and you will not have and even in the control plan, you will not have on, on, on the, on the um, sampling plan where the, all the fish has to be stacked on the pier and then sorted and weighed according to the sampling plan. You will not have enough ice to re-ice all of this fish. And on the admission today of the SFPA, this will affect, <coughs> will affect the quality of the product, but it actually will also potentially affect the... Um, the condition of the product to, to, to the point that it may deteriorate enough to actually get contaminated and affect public health. <clears throat> that is um, that that is a fact of what what is going to happen. Um, I cannot understand why that uh, there was no um, notice given of the possibility of this happening. The first we heard of it was on the evening of the 16th, which was a Friday evening. So 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 um, 
we had no opportunity to 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 make any inquiry until till Monday morning. So on a Friday evening, we were told that uh, all fishery products would have to in the future be weighed on on the pier, um, with no warning whatsoever, no um, accusation made against the fishermen, no um, no evidence produced to 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 make it that that um, fish, fisheries fishermen could defend themselves. So just out of the blue, stop weighing on, 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 the, on the auction hall and weigh on the pier is, is unacceptable for, from a fisherman's point of view and actually un, unworkable and a danger, a danger to um, public health and a danger to the health and safety of the people doing the work. <clears throat> on the earlier, on the, on the, on the um, fisheries amendment bill, we have the same problem with the... Um, in our organization with the, the basic problem with the penalty points for masters is, is one of the same problems, we would call it the main problem, in that um, fisheries offenses are prosecuted under the Criminal Justice Act. If an uh, alleged offense is an allegation of an offense is made by the authority, they will apply points to the license and with this bill now, points will apply to the master. On the case being taken to the court and the offence subsequently being found to not have occurred, the master and the vessel will be found to be um, innocent of the offence, but actually they get to keep the penalty points anyway. So, But uh, just as is in this system, we cannot see, we cannot understand how, how this can be in a, in, a, in a country with a common law system. Uh, and um, the, uh, once again, it, it, it's 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 um, an, an imposition on on, on a fish, fisherman that um, they cannot they cannot actually see the evidence and defend themselves and be found to be to be to be innocent. <clears throat> it, it, even if they are found innocent in the in the case of the prosecution, they will still get to keep the points. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Okay, Senator Lambert. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, tell me. Um, like to obviously acknowledge and welcome the, the guests and thank them for their actual open statement, which is very, very helpful. Um, I think, look, the last four months between Brexit penalty points and now this change on the 16th, like it's been an amazing, like four months we, as an industry. It's very hard to equate that to any other industry in Ireland and what you're actually going through. Um, I touched on the food safety issue regarding the actual practices that's going to happen in the piers because of this new change. Um, to me, it's a massive issue. I don't think it's been taught through itself. I might ask you to actually comment on that as well. Um, literally, I described it as, you know, 1950s, going back to Mickey Cone in a stall scenario. It really has that kind of feel to it. And the logic of it, and actually the actual... If we decided to do this on the ground, I'm sure they would have said, stop, they they would have stopped us, but because we didn't decide to do it, it's okay. So I just think it's a huge issue. So I just might ask you the actual comment on it. Regarding the actual common law issue, and I think this is probably the penalty points, it's the biggest issue that I've seen in fisheries in my time in this committee over the last five years. Um, the actual issue that the minister seems to be going on, I heard his testimony in the last um, hearings. I might ask you to comment on that. He seemed to say that legally this is the actual one he's bound on because of legal actual information he's got. Um, look, I've started my own inquiries into this. Could I ask your own, your own information regarding that advice? Because that, to me, it was very strange, to say the least. And I asked him straight out, compared to any other issue in his department, where is this two-tier system? Like, regarding the agricultural side, it doesn't exist. But on the fishery side, it does. So I might ask, you know, maybe for clarity and your own view regarding that statement that the Minister made at the last meeting itself. Um, and regarding the issue about the media, like, in hindsight, I think we should have this meeting back to front. I would have preferred if he came in first and we could have the actual regulator in afterwards. Because I do think this issue about the media is something that we nearly need to have to go back and talk to him about. If there are leaks, if there are information, like, my first question would be, has the Data Protection Commissioner been informed? Has there has Helen Dixon been asked about where this information has come from? If there is a leak regarding the actual information itself, we've had articles published in three major papers. Like to me, this information has to come from one or two sources, either the commission or from the actual regulatory body itself. 
like to me, it's a data protection issue. She, she mentioned it herself. Um, I might ask your views regarding that itself, because having a one-sided conversation is something that I think we just have to kind of stop. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Senator. Just on the form of the meeting, it was at the request of the fisher organisations that we went yeah. in this order. I appreciate uh, that. Yeah. They, they wanted to hear the SFPA first, the way they could comment back. Now, I know there's a, I have a, a number of the witnesses that want to reply, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to give the team very shortly. I'm going to the hint John Ward because he hasn't been in. He hasn't been in previously. So, um, John Ward, I will let, let you um, 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 make um, answer the questions of the Senator Lombards. John, you're on mute there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity. And in relation to the comments made by Senator Lombard, all I would say is about the data leaks. Um, who benefited from the data leaks that were given to the three major news organisations? It certainly wasn't the fishing industry. Um, the, the other point I would make... Uh, is go back to the weighing system. Uh, the SFPA today expressed serious doubts about the weighing system in the factories. All I would like to say in relation to that, the type of weighing system that exists in the factories in Ireland is exactly the same as what is in factories in Scotland, is in factories in Norway, is in factories in Denmark, and uh, uh, for some reason, the authorities in these countries don't seem to have any problem with them. Uh, in relation to one of the other uh, que uh, questions that were put before the committee was the, um, the weighing systems that are in the factories was approved by the SFPAA. And further to that, they uh, insisted that CCT uh, cameras be installed so that the people... Uh, uh, the SFPA could watch the weighing of the fish in their offices. I would like to make one other point. The SFPA said today that they have 150 people or 150 members of staff and that we have 11 factories in total uh, producing pelagic fish. Surely out of that 150, if they aren't satisfied by what is happening in the factories, they could find 11 people who could spend uh, a day in the factories to see what what is exactly happening, but there is none willingness to do that. Um, on penalty points, uh, I, the other point I would like to make is that we we as an industry tried very very hard to engage with the minister, but we have seen ministers changed, but nothing nothing has changed. I think the problem we have is that. There is an unwillingness of the what we call the permanent government to change. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we have we have now reached allocated time, and I know um, other witnesses want to, want to make points. But on behalf of the committee, I want to thank you all for putting forward your views and concerns on this legislation. I know you're extremely concerned, and on top of Brexit, is putting your industry on, on, under 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 extreme pressure. But um, you know, we we, um, we we obviously have listened intently to what you said here today, and I know um, 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 people in the, especially the, the TDs and senators in the in, in in the constituencies where you know this industry is extremely important, will be bringing it bringing it to the floor, will be bringing it to the floor of the Dáil and the Senate in in the next couple of weeks. So um, um, I hope today's meeting was was beneficial to the organisations, and I know you will be lobbying us and continuously going forward to try and get uh, a, a resolution of, of the issues that you see facing you at, at the moment. So I propose we suspend the meeting now for 15 minutes, and we're going to resume in private session on MS Teams at 17:45. So thanks, thanks everyone, uh, and thanks to all the witnesses. Thank you. Thank you, Chair.